So this lecture is steady flow data requirements. It's about the, the data that you need to run a steady flow model. All right. And in the first part of the lecture, there's a little bit of introduction about some theory. And we're going to talk a little bit about hydrologic routing methods versus hydraulic routing methods. RAS is focused on the hydraulic routing methods, right? Um, St. Manon equations, these are uh, what you look at in the unsteady flow class. Um, and so we, these, in these hydraulic routing methods, we solve uh, partial differential equations. The energy equation, that's not really a partial differential equation, um, but it's still more of a hydraulic routing method. And the hydrologic routing methods, those are based on continuity and these empirical or semi-empirical uh, analytical storage discharge relationships. And there's many of those. RAS has uh, uh, one of them, muskingum cooge routing. That is uh, in, in RAS. You have that as an option. When the, if you took it the, take the unsteady flow class, you'll see that sometimes that's useful in very steep reaches where the 1D uh, finite difference model can have uh, trouble um, in steep reaches. And so that it's useful in those situations. So we talked about this root number yesterday again, which is think of it as a ratio between the inertial and gravitational forces. But for me, at least, it's, it's easier to think of it in terms of processes and think of it as a ratio of advection or the, the flow of the water over the waves or wave propagation. Or you can think of it as the influence of how fast the water surface information can propagate in a model. So. A good analogy is in the stadium. If you see people doing a wave, you know, that is this term here, this gravitational wave. Um, and if you see people walking through a stadium, that is this one, right? And there's a, there's a limit to how fast that wave can be in a stadium because it's like how fast people can get up and get down in, in a stadium. But in the water, it's a function of the water depth. And that's just a property of the water, of like the medium, right? Like it's a function of it. Density, which you don't see here, but gravity and, and the water depth. And this one here is the flow. So that is like the people moving. Um, okay. And another way of thinking of it is, let's say there's a pond. There's just a, maybe still water or a slow current moving. And you toss a rock. It'll form uh, waves, ripples. And those will propagate away from that, that impact area, a uh, point. But if there's a current, those waves are going to be moved, right? And if the current is strong enough, there's going to be a point where there's something called wave blocking, where the, the waves can't propagate upstream, right? Because the current is going faster than those waves. So that's when you have supercritical flow. That's telling you that the wave information can't move upstream because the current is so strong. This is why when we do a supercritical solution, we saw from upstream, because the dominant form of the energy is the current. And that's coming from upstream. Whereas when we solve subcritical flow, the more important thing is the water surface and like the, how that impacts the upstream uh, solution. That's why when we do subcritical, it's from downstream. You start downstream. And when we solve supercritical flows, that's from upstream. And that has to do with uh, the dominant process, or you can think of it as information, right? The, 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 the speed at which information propagates in your, uh, in your domain. Does that make sense? All right. So this is why uh, this fruit number is an important parameter in the model, because it determines kind of the behavior of the solution and how we need to go about solving it. Um, and it gets tricky when you have mixed flow. In some places, you have subcritical. In other places, you have supercritical flow. And I think later in the week, we're going to talk about how we deal with that situation when parts of the domain are one and one and other parts of the domain are the other. And, and uh, theoretically, the, the fruit number, that, that, that threshold is one. But in real life, uh, we use, actually, in RAS, we use 0.94. And the reason for it is because once you start getting close to the fruit number, it, the flow becomes very unstable. And it just takes a, a very small disturbance in the flow to trigger that supercritical flow, and then your, your hydraulic conditions change very quickly. Um, it's kind of like, uh, you know, how you trigger turbulent flow. You've, have, have you seen like wind tunnel tests where they will put just a wire in their, their, in their uh, wind tunnel, and that triggers turbulent flow? Um, 
So it just takes a very minor thing in your model to trigger turbulent flow in real life. Okay. It's not working. Okay, uh, we talked about that. In RAS, we usually use the Manning's roughness coefficient, but you can use the, the roughness height as well. Or, um, and we talked a little bit about this yesterday, the differences between mild slope, critical slope, steep slopes. I, I'm not going to cover that too much today. The, the types of profiles, you know, adverse horizontal, these are very easy to identify because of the, the bed slopes. These are uh, less easy because you need to know what the hydraulic conditions are, not just the bed slope. And knowing which, in, in practice, this, this is useful for uh, if you're designing structures or if you want to describe your results to somebody, like in a report, that's when you, this kind of stuff is useful. Otherwise, if you're just modeling, it's not as useful. Likewise, these uh, possible profiles, right? If you're designing the structure, then you're designing which kind of profile you want or if you're describing the results that you're getting from a RAS model. But otherwise, the model really takes care of all the profiles for you. And as I mentioned, whether you're subcritical, supercritical, or mixed flow is going to impact how you solve and what kind of boundary conditions you need, whether you, you need upstream boundary conditions or downstream boundary conditions or both. If it's subcritical, I mentioned you need downstream boundary conditions. You need a stage, right? Um, or normal depth or, or something downstream, and I'll, I'll cover those in a, in a second. If it's super critical, then you need upstream boundary conditions. Uh, of, there's different kinds, and I'll mention those in a little bit. And then if you have mixed flow, then you could uh, need both. This is the steady flow analysis editor, um, which you can get to from the main window by clicking on the icon that looks like this guy, this like running person on a flat, on a flat bed. And this is where you select your flow regime. You have to know this ahead of time before you start running and before you enter your boundary conditions and all that because it's going to determine how you enter your boundary conditions. So that's one of the first things you need to think about and, and do in RAS. Okay, types of uh, external boundary conditions. By external, I mean at the ends of the model, at the upstream end or downstream end. The types that you can have are the known water surface elevation. You can have a critical depth, uh, normal depth, so in this normal depth, in this case, is a stage boundary condition. Based on the flow, it computes a normal depth and specifies that stage. And the user specifies a, a friction slope and a, a roughness coefficient at the boundary. Well, that's at your cross-section. But it uses Manning's equation to figure out what that, that stage should be. And then this rating curve, which is a stage a flow uh, curve. Um, yeah, and then based on your flow, it'll extract what the stage should be at that location. Your boundary locations, your external boundaries are always going to be there for you when you open this. And then you can select which boundary condition type you want. If you want internal boundary conditions, you can add them. Also, when you specify boundary conditions, you can do it for all the profiles uh, here or one at a time. So let's say you have 15 flows that you want to run, steady flows. You can make them all normal depths. Or you can say, I want only these to be normal depths and this, these other profiles or flows to be uh, a different kind of boundary condition. So it's kind of flexible that way. Any external boundaries, including tributaries, those need to be specified. So if you have a tributary here, that also needs a boundary condition. However, you at any cross section, you can go in and uh, specify local flows, inflows. So those could be um, due to like surface runoff or you know maybe a tributary that you don't want to model. You just want to have that flow come in. Um, you could do that as well. Um, if you're modeling an unsteady event, right, your flow hydrograph is going to attenuate, and it looks like somebody was talking about that yesterday already here. Um, and the way you account for that is by changing the flows at, at different points along your, your model, different cross sections, and that, that's how you do it. You can put lateral structures in your model and, and, and take the flow out of your system or not take the flow out, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, and just compute those flows at the lateral structures. And those can be connected to a storage area, another cross-section, or even nothing. They can be, go out of the system. From a couple slides back with yeah. the um, external boundary conditions, yeah. what would be the application to use normal depth versus critical depth versus like a rating curve? Why would you choose one or the other? Um, it depends on the data that you have. Uh, stages are going to be better 
but they're more difficult to get that data. Um, whereas normal depth, all you need is a, a friction slope and a roughness. And as a friction slope, you could kind of approximate that by the slope of your, your river. Okay. So it's just, uh, there's more uncertainty with the normal depth, but it's easier to estimate if you don't have data. And what would the rating curve, what would you use for that? Rating curve, if you have uh, a gauge and there is a known rating curve for that location, you can utilize that. Or if there's a different model already set up, an unsteady model, and they can give you a rating curve for that location, then you can utilize that. And that's better than normal depth. So I would say, like, in terms of preference, I would put stage at the top, then maybe rating curve, then normal depth. And this is the same thing I was talking about before, about how you, you, you can deal with the, the junctions. So you'll notice here there's 9.79, which is this location. And so the, the flow, instead of letting the model kind of solve for that flow at that location based on the incoming flows, from these two rivers, um, it's over. It's overwritten here, and then again, it's overwritten here to account for that flow attenuation. And you can add as many points as you want these flow change locations. This is what we were talking about earlier: the wave attenuation going downstream. So the, this volume is the same volume of this. It's just that it has been spread out over a longer period, and therefore the peak is is less. Lateral structures can be tricky because they're fundamentally a, a, an unsteady process. So they can be difficult to model in a steady flow model. They can be done two ways. They can be here, uh, tailwater connection. They can be connected to a storage area cross section or, or they can be going out of the system. And by lateral structure, this is a structure that you put kind of next to your cross sections. You draw a, a line, that's your lateral structure, and you can give the structure uh, an elevations, you can put culverts, gates, and different things along your lateral structure. So it could be like a levee that's next to your river. Um, and yeah, you could have different, uh, you can have gates, uh, culverts, and we're gonna talk about those uh, later on in the week, but just know that it's, it's kind of a, an element that you can put next to your river that's going to take flow out of your river in between cross sections and it's going to compute flows along that lateral structure using the station elevation data that you specify and whatever structures you put in there like gates and culverts and the gates if you put them in they're going to have a like an opening position and, uh, and all that um, yeah and it'll just take flow out of your river and that's that's tricky because the flows through the structure is actually a function of the stage in the river, right? But so that's an unsteady process. And in, in a steady model, how, you, how do you t take care of that? Well, um, there's two ways of, of doing structures. You can do it with optimization, where the, the model tries to compute the flow at the structure and then take that flow out of your, your main stem and then iterate, right? Because the flow at the structure is a function of the stage and the stage you're taking flow out, so if you take more flow out, it's going to reduce the stage, and you're going to get less flow at the structure, so it's got to iterate. If you have many of these structures, they can have a hard time converging. Um, the way you turn that on is by going to the steady flow uh, analysis window, flow optimizations, and then for each structure, there's a little checkbox, and you turn that on. So it's going to try to iterate at that structure and try to reach a, you know, converge to a solution. If you don't turn that off, it'll take the flow It'll compute a flow at that structure, but it won't take the flow out of the, the main stem, right? And so that's a much easier solution, but it's, and generally it's gonna overestimate those flows at the structure because the stages on the river are gonna be too high. Does that make sense? At any cross section, you can specify, this is when, when you're really refining your model and, and you're, you're tweaking your results, you can specify a change in energy, a change in water surface, you can specify a known water surface or uh, enter an, addi an additional energy loss. You think there's additional losses that you're not capturing in your model, you can add them uh, in this editor here. So this says changes in water surface and energy grade. It's not just changes, it's actually the values as well. So you can specify the water surface, not just the change in water surface there. Um, that's how you, how you do it with this option. The optimization why, um, why would that not be default? Because, because they're sometimes challenging. Um, 
stability they, they're checked off? Yeah, a lot of the defaults in RAS are based on kind of robustness. You know, we want you to get an answer first before you kind of uh, try to refine it or make it more accurate. And the easiest way to get an answer is by not having that checkbox on. Um, and then you, it's better to like turn one structure at a time or a couple structures at a time. If you have a big model and you optimize all your structures right away, you're probably not going to get uh, an answer. Um, so it's good to like start simple and add complexity as you go. That way, if there is a structure that's giving you problems, you can identify it and go look at it and see what's going on and, you know, yeah. All right, other options. So observed data, you can specify uh, observed data for any of your profiles at any cross-section. And you can also specify rating curves, which is this slide, at any, at any gauge. And notice that both in this one and in the previous one, the, um, the observed data doesn't have to be at your cross-section. It can be in between cross-sections. So uh, that's the downstream distance. And then here you have the similar thing, distance from the upstream to that point. And when they get plotted, we'll, we'll show plots later, um, they'll plot at the right location. Come on. All right, here. This is an example of that. Uh, the steady uh, model solution. These are all lateral structures. That, well, these are bridges, and the observed data shows up as these uh, diamonds, I think they are, diamonds. Here, here, here. What do you guys think about, about this result here? The green line is the energy gray line. If you can't see, it's kind of small back for the people back there. But you know, when you're calibrating your model, you're trying to match the water levels. It is a 1D model. So sometimes like the, you'll see that the observed data doesn't quite hit the water levels, but it, maybe it's close to the energy gray line. Why would that be? Well, in this case, I believe it's because there's a bend. All right, so Sam's going to talk about that. But so at, at a bend, you have super elevation along the outside of the bend. And this gauge happened to be on the outside of the bend. And so as the flow went around the bend, it kind of, you know, it, it, it goes higher at the outside of the bend. And that, the energy gray line is more representative of that elevation, right? So, so that's why the, the energy gray line matched the uh, gauge, whereas the, um, the, uh, the water surface did not. So those are the kinds of things that um, make 1D modeling interesting and sometimes challenging, and that's why it requires more skill, because in multi-dimensional modeling, you don't have to think about these things. Why, you know, what does it mean to have a 1D result and compare that to a three-dimensional world? Um, whereas if you have a 3D model, it is what it is, you know? Um, all right, I think that's the last slide. That's all I have. Is there any questions? So steady flow modeling, there's not a lot of data input um, compared to other, uh, like unsteady flow. But there is a lot of options, as you saw. And I didn't, we, like yesterday we talked about you know, the, the different options for friction slope and different computational stuff. And we didn't cover that in this slide. But most of the time, really, uh, you don't have to deal with that. Um, the steady flow is pretty, is pretty robust. And you can get it running pretty easily. Um, unsteady is a lot more challenging, especially finite, the 1D finite difference model.